Before I begin, I just want to say again, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you, and thank you for welcoming me and visiting with me. It's always a, a true joy for me to go to different places and meet sisters in the Lord and to hear about your churches and your lives and to see the faithfulness of God everywhere I go. Um, as I was visiting with some of the ladies earlier um, this afternoon over lunch, the comment was made about how we are gonna be telling stories all throughout eternity, stories of how we're interrelated or someone knows someone or someone had an impact on someone else um, for God's glory. And so I just encourage you to love this congregation. Um, this is where God has placed you. There is no perfect place, right? But these are the people God has given you to love, and I encourage you to do that. Before we begin, I'd also like to tell you about a few resources that you might find helpful, and they are at my website, CherylMarshall.com. The first one is a free download. It is a five-day mini Bible study on Psalm 27, and it's called Trusting God in Troubled Times. And also on the website, I have several articles that were written by me and Caroline Neuheiser together. So if you go to the media page, you will find several articles about speaking the truth in love, some things that we didn't actually cover in the book, some things that you might find helpful as you move forward. So one more time, let's pray together and then we will dig into this session. Heavenly Father, thank you for these women, thank you for their church, and Lord, I thank you for the love you have showered on them through Christ. I pray, Lord, that they will now shower your love upon one another, that they will continue to pass the coin of speaking the truth in love, giving truth with love, even as the women spoke about here during the time of the Q&A. God, please help us all, including myself, to stay alert here in the late afternoon. And may, again, Lord, you be honored and glorified in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was five years old, I attended a large elementary school and there were three kindergarten classes. And of course, as a five-year-old, I was one of the 75 kindergartners running around on the field at recess. And every year there was an annual, that doesn't make sense, every year there was an annual, <laughs> it's afternoon, right? <laughs> so every year there was an annual kindergarten graduation. And every year at this annual graduation, <laughs> there, was, um, there was a kindergartner who gave the graduation speech. And the year I was there, I was asked to give that speech. Actually, the teacher, my teacher, approached my mother several weeks in advance and said, would Cheryl be willing to do this? And so my mother had a conversation with me, and I guess I, my mother, decided this is what I would do. And so I was five. I could not read. I could not write. And so my mother went through this process of, once she knew the guidelines from the teacher, of helping me prepare and learn this little speech. She wrote it down, we practiced it together at breakfast, we practiced it while we were driving in the car. And on the day of the graduation, when it was my turn in the ceremony to give the speech, I still remember walking up these red carpeted steps and then walking up to a microphone that was about this high and I gave the kindergarten graduation speech and I did it without a hitch. I did it with no fear. I had no idea at age five to be afraid of hundreds of eyes staring at me. You know, with 75 kindergartners, think of all the parents and the aunts and uncles and grandparents. There were hundreds of people at this ceremony, but I had no fear before the crowd. But I think there's another reason, and it's a much more significant reason that I was not afraid, and that was because of my mother. She had given me the words to say. She had prepared me for that moment, 
And as I spoke, she was near, right there in the audience. Maybe you know where I'm going to be going with this. As an adult, I've often been fearful to speak the truth in love. I believe that's a common feeling among believers. Like me, maybe you have felt ill-equipped, inadequate, or insufficient for the task. And we are not alone in feeling that way or recognizing our own weaknesses. We stand in good company with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He led many people to Christ and planted numerous churches throughout the Mediterranean area. He both suffered well for the Lord and he served the Lord well. And yet, when he spoke of his ministry, and it's the Apostle Paul, so this is a ministry of words, right? When he spoke of his ministry for Christ, this is what he said in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 5. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. I am not sufficient for speaking the truth in love. You aren't, and neither was Paul. We can't rescue anyone. We can't fix anyone. We can't save anyone. We can't change anyone. Only God can, and he does. In this session, I want you to see that our confidence to speak the true and truth into others' lives is rooted in God alone. God is our confidence to speak. I would like us to read Ephesians 4, 15 through 16 one last time together. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Consider what is being said here in verses 15 through 16. Christ makes the body grow. Christ is the subject. There's this clause or this phrase. If anyone here would be the grammar person among you, I don't know if it's a clause or phrase at the moment. But then we have the word makes. That is our verb. Christ is the one who makes the body grow. He is the one who produces the outcomes. He works through his people, growing and building up the church. Jesus is the master builder. He is the one who brings his church and his people to completion. And so after all that you've heard this weekend, you may be thinking, okay, Cheryl, I see what Ephesians 4 says about how we are to relate to one another within the body of Christ. But you may also be thinking something like this. I'm not sure I can do this. I feel so inadequate to speak biblical truth into my friend or loved one's life. I've got my own weaknesses. I've got my own hang-ups, my own problems and sin. I'm not even sure what to say to comfort her, to encourage her, and certainly not to confront her. I don't know how the other person will take it. Honestly, I find all of this rather scary, and it makes me very uncomfortable. I have felt that way too, and there are days that even now I still do, but I want to share with you what I have learned and am still learning, and it is this. It's very simple. The Lord is trustworthy to be with us and to help us to obey him even when we speak the truth in love. When I gave that kindergarten speech, it really was only possible because of my mother. Like I said, she gave me the words, she prepared me, and when I spoke, she was near. In the same way, and actually in an infinitely greater way, you can speak truth into the lives of those you love because God has given you his word. Even now, he is preparing you to speak his word. And when you sit and you speak lives and you speak God's truth into the lives of those you love, he'll be with you. Maybe it's over a cup of coffee at Starbucks. 
and your friend starts to cry, the Lord will be with you. When someone stops you in this lobby right here after church and you see the angst on her face, the Lord will be with you. Even today when you are driving home and you get a phone call in the car and you look at that number or you look at a number up here and you know there is trouble on the other end of that line, the Lord will be with you. The confidence to speak truth and love arises from knowing the power of the word and the presence of God. To have confidence to speak truth and love, you need to be convinced of the power of the scriptures to transform lives, but also the presence of the Lord. He will be with you and in you to minister through you as you share his truth with those in need. We can learn a lot about the presence of God in our lives by looking at the conversation between God and Moses at the burning bush. So I'd like you to turn to Exodus 3. As you do, I will set this up for you. I'm sure you are familiar with this. But Moses had been out of Egypt for 40 years. He was a fugitive, and now he was a shepherd in the land of Midian. And God appears to him at the burning bush, a bush that appears to be on fire and yet it is not consumed. The Israelites are still slaves in Egypt and they have been crying out to God. And the Lord heard them. And in Exodus 3, verses 9 through 10, God says this to Moses. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God calls Moses to this particular task. And Moses does not respond how Isaiah later does and says, who says, here I am, send me. Instead, Moses starts to argue. He starts to explain to God why he can't do this, why he is inadequate for the task. Like Moses, you may have objections to stepping into another person's life with the word of God. So let's take a look at God's answers to Moses and see what we can learn from God's answers as we build our confidence in God to speak the truth and love. So the first lesson we learn from this conversation is that the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So basically, Moses was saying, who am I that I should go? God, this is a huge mistake. How could I possibly be the right person for this monumental task? And what's interesting is God doesn't really answer the question about Moses. He gives the answer about himself because that is what Moses needed to learn. God responded with, I will be with you. When considering speaking biblical truth into the life of someone, you might wonder like Moses. You might think, God, who am I that I should go and talk to her about that? Who am I that I can even say anything to her? I feel too inadequate for the task. But I want you to remember the promise that Christ gave to the disciples before he ascended into heaven. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, he said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I find it so interesting that when Christ gave the disciples instructions to speak, to make disciples, to teach, this would require their words in very uncomfortable situations. That is when Christ promised 
his presence. He is also with us now to give courage, wisdom, and grace so we can complete the task he has given us to speak. So just as God was with Moses, Christ promises to be with you. Be confident that he is present as you share his word. Second thing we learn from this conversation between God and Moses is that the Lord has sent you. Exodus 3, verses 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. We find here that Moses was concerned that the Israelites would ask him by whose name, meaning by whose authority he had come to them. And God was explaining to Moses that Moses was not going to be approaching the people based on any authority or message of his own. Rather, he would speak to them the word of the Lord by the authority of the Lord. Moses would simply communicate God's message. So like Moses, you might be thinking, well, what right do I have to speak into her life? I'm no authority or expert on the issues she's facing. But I'd like you to remember a couple things. Number one, God has providentially placed you into her life and made you aware of her need. God hasn't sent you to give her your message or your wisdom, but God's message and wisdom, his encouragement, his comfort and care. And so approach your loved one with a humble confidence in the word of God as the source of the encouragement or exhortation you give. You are sent to her with his word and his word has authority in and over her life. Third, the Lord will validate his word. Now we're moving into Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand again, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. What is so interesting here at the beginning of chapter 4 is that Moses stopped asking questions. Instead, he started making assumptions. He assumed the worst. Nobody will listen to me. They will not receive what I have to say. Why should I even try this? But notice God's response. It's a very strange response. And imagine how surprised Moses was with what God told him to do. What kind of response was this? Taking a staff, turning it into a snake, turning it back into a staff again. What point was God making? I think he was making this point, that he alone is all-powerful. If he could take an inanimate object, turn it into an animate object, and turn it back to an inanimate object, could he not change the hearts of the people? Could he not soften those hearts of stone? Could he not open those stopped ears? God was able to authenticate his messenger, and his message. Moses simply had to trust and obey and leave the results to God. You might be tempted to assume the worst as well with your friend. I know she won't listen to me. 
She won't like what I have to say. Anyways, I will totally make a fool of myself. I shouldn't even try. Remember your concerns about how she responds to biblical truth should not stop you. Your primary concern is to obey God by graciously speaking biblical truth according to her need, just like we learned about in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. The Lord is powerful to validate and prove his word in her heart and life. You might not see an immediate response, but that's really okay. The work of his word is in his hands. So trust the Lord that he will apply his word to her life in his own way and time. If she is his child, he is working in her life in ways you don't even know about. He is powerful to apply his word to her heart and to change her. The fourth lesson we learned from this conversation is this, the Lord will teach you the Lord will teach you, Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. What did Moses mean that he was slow of speech and slow of tongue? Did he have a speech impediment? Did he have a fear of public speaking? Did he find the language difficult back in Egypt now that he'd been gone for 40 years? I'm not sure what exactly he meant. But whatever the case may be, we see here that God didn't see it as an obstacle at all. He directed Moses to put his full confidence in him, his creator. Have you felt like Moses? Do your personal obstacles to speak truth and love seem too large to overcome? You might think, I'm not very good at talking. I'm not a good conversationalist. I get too tongue-tied, it makes me nervous. You know, I don't know my Bible very well. I'm not sure what to say. I'm not quick on my feet. All I know is that I'm not cut out for this. I want you to remember that just like God made Moses, God made you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your concerns. And like my husband has often reminded me, God not only knows your limitations, he has ordained them. They are part of his plan for you. But he still calls you to speak the truth in love. He created you and he's given you your unique way of communicating with others. He's given you his spirit to teach you his word. I love Psalm 51 verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And then a few verses later in verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Trust that the Lord is able to teach you what to say from his word and to enable you to say it. There is no personal obstacle too great for him. And finally, our last lesson is this. The Lord will provide a way for you to obey Exodus 4, verses 13 through 16. But he, Moses, said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. This was Moses' last attempt. It wasn't an objection as much as it was a blatant refusal to obey. 
oh my Lord, please send someone else. And he was saying this after all that God had already promised. There was nothing left for Moses to say other than, no God, I am not going to do this. Go find someone else who will. And look at God's response. He was angry with Moses because of his resistance. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And yet, as we see all through the Old Testament, and as we see revealed all throughout the New Testament, God is a God of grace. He was so gracious to Moses. He was angry with Moses because of his stubborn unbelief, and yet he provided Moses with what Moses thought he needed, someone else to do the talking. He provided his brother Aaron to help Moses speak to Pharaoh and the Israelites. God would speak to Moses, Moses would speak to Aaron, and Aaron to the people. Notice here, so important, God provided a way for Moses to obey and fulfill God's good purposes. Do you find yourself in the same place as Moses? Maybe you're sitting there with your arms folded externally or maybe internally and you're thinking, I don't want to talk to her about her situation. I have good reasons not to become involved. I'm sure someone else will do it, but it certainly won't be me. May I kindly remind you that your rationalizations and excuses will never remove your responsibility to build up others in the body of Christ by speaking the truth in love. God's intention is for you and for me and for every believer to communicate truth for the good of his people. Speaking to one another is the primary way to do this, but the Lord in his graciousness and kindness may provide other means to help you communicate with your loved one. Maybe it'll be easier for you to just say, hey, can I read you a verse? It's not you talking, it's the Lord talking. Maybe there's a um, sound biblical book or booklet pertaining to something going on in her life and you're able to share that with her. Maybe you can invite her to church or to a Bible study that you know would be helpful to her. Maybe you can connect her to another strong believer even here who has walked her road. But then, whatever it may be that you use to say what you find is hard to say, I encourage you to seek to discuss with her what she has read or heard in one of these other ways and seek to reinforce those truths in her life with a personal conversation. Remember, it is by God's providence that he has caused your lives to cross. Trust the Lord that he will provide for you the opportunities, the resources, the instruction and encouragement you need to confidently speak truth with grace. He will provide a way for you to obey. So in each of these five objections raised by Moses, God showed him that he would provide everything Moses lacked. God promised Moses his presence and his power to do what he had called Moses to do. And you know the rest of the story. God used Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and to the promised land, and God was always faithful to give Moses the words to speak. And now the Lord promises you the same. He, promise you, he promises you his presence, his power, and every provision so that you may faithfully speak truth and love for the building up of his people. Like God was for Moses, he will be with you. He will send you to those in need. He will validate the truth you share. He will teach you what to say. He will provide whatever you need in order to obey him in this way. God alone is our confidence to speak. We began our weekend in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and Paul was urging the Ephesians to speak the truth in love, and Paul spoke out of what he lived. Paul had been with the Ephesian church for at least three years, and I'd like to share with you what Paul said to the elders of the Ephesian church the last time 
He ever saw those men as he was preparing to sail for Jerusalem. Listen to how he characterized his three years of conversations with them. Acts 20, verses 18 through 20. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Verses 24 to 27. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And then verse 32, and notice how it sounds so much like Ephesians 4. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. My encouragement to you is that like Paul, you do not shrink from speaking truth and love, but have confidence in the power of the scriptures and the presence of God to speak his word to one another so that you and those you love and, and your church, this beautiful church, Grace Bible Church, that each of you will be built up and that God will receive the glory through each of you in Jesus Christ. As we close, I want you to think once again of your loved one who is struggling spiritually. I would also like you to think of how you can love her well as I read these final questions. Number one, will you obey God's call to speak his truth into her life? Will you carefully consider what her specific spiritual burden is and then seek to respond to it biblically? Will you trust that God's word is powerful to transform her life? Will you be gracious with her as God has been gracious with you? As you speak truth and love, will you place your confidence, your wholehearted trust in God alone? The Lord builds his church through the proclamation of his word. He does that from the pulpit, but he also does that across kitchen tables and across thousands of miles on phone calls. God transforms lives with his truth and with his grace. And in his grand design for the church, each of you are builders called to build up one another by speaking the truth in love. And as I leave you today, my prayer for you is that the words of your mouth arising from the meditations of your heart will please and glorify our Savior. Let's pray. Once again, I'm going to give you a moment for silent prayer as you reflect upon the things you have heard, and I encourage you to give thanks to the Lord and to also ask him for his strength in areas where you know that you need his help. Heavenly Father, you are our confidence to speak, just as you were for Paul and as you became for Moses. You've given us your presence, your power, your promises, and we confess that without you, we can do nothing. And so we ask you to do your good work in us and through us as we build up one another in Christ. I pray that these women here, these dear sisters of mine, will grow in love for you and for one another. Oh Lord, please build up your church in love to the glory of Christ, in whose precious name we pray. Amen.